Do I get a ringy dingy? Not yet. I still got the noise. But when the noise stops, I'll, I'll give you April Danger Protocol 27 X ray. Right. This is hilarious. This is the longest ringy. It just ended. Um, anyway, here comes the protocol. Are you ready? Yes. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. Hello, Your Eminence. Hello, Your Effluence. What should we talk about? The role of the circumflex in unraveling the Hotel Clinton conspiracy of 911 and the murder of Princess Diana. So that means you have not looked at the radio show ad today. I can't find it. Yes, you can. It's anyway, I was looking for it, and I didn't get it in time. Well, that's a lame excuse. I started working at 6 a.m., and I got done at around 12.50. That's almost seven hours. Uh, you need to find it. Would somebody put a link to today's radio show ad in the chat room so David can click that link, and he needs to look at the first two images, um, and then when he, when they're going to give you the link, uh, and you need to look at the first two images because your head's on a plate too. Ginger Cookie just put up the the live show ad. If you look above the screen of McCain's thing, but anyway, you when I've you got it. okay, take a look at the top two images. Right. The thumbnail image and then the very top image. Right. What do you see? I see a head and probably what something looks like an autopsy. Uh, do you see any comment about heads on a plate? Yes, Savile's murder puts Bush head on a plate. Yeah, actually, I think it push it puts probably more than two Bush's heads on a plate. But um, this is what's called upping the ante or letting it all hang out. But uh, it doesn't terrify you to be associated with those pictures, does it? Not particularly. No, I think it's a wonderful uh, weapon. Uh, and I want everyone to know that as a courtesy to the surviving brother of Colonel James Sabow, U.S. Marine Corps, I blind carbon and him to the radio show announcement that I sent to Michael Hoffa and David Tochin of NTSB. And here's something you don't know since we haven't talked to David uh, today, David, but there's a very powerful and prestigious law firm in Texas that is engaging on one of our flanks, that being the helicopter wrongful death in Frisco, Colorado that occurred less than two weeks ago. Uh, and as of this morning, the principal partners at that law firm had never heard of the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot, uh, but they have now. And uh, these two complete dolts, David Tochin, he sent his wifey poo out to San Francisco to make sure that they all sang the Kumbaya on the Asiana 214 flight that never crashed. Uh, and then, of course, here comes a screech alert, so if anybody doesn't like hearing the FAA's name uh, pronounced properly, um, plug your ears, because here it comes. Michael Huerta! Uh, Michael Huerta has known everything I've known for over four years, and uh, I don't expect people in the United States of America uh, in these phony baloney jobs that never end as long as their uh, serving Satan doesn't abate. Uh, however, there's a movie maker in England that I've talked to on the phone, and there's a movie producer in Vancouver, BC, who you and I will both meet in October or November <coughs> of this year, David. Is that interesting to you? Yeah. Okay, well, you go out and give us this antique drivel after I've just put a couple of bush heads on the plate. Okay, so I've just uh, browsed through some of the collage, or at least some of them are, but uh, I'm just um, scrolling through, and very intriguing. Who's that good-looking guy with the red tie with the hat, and it says suits, and there's another guy who's not as good-looking on the right? Uh, the guy on the left is a pompous ass. The guy on the right is a paid actor, and the guy in the center is the real deal. 
Oh, okay. And who's the actor? I have no idea, but do you know what the name of the show is? Suits? Yeah, and I didn't know that, but I got a compliment today. Oh, somebody put up a picture of the circumcised, oh, excuse me, I'm genuflecting, of Michael. Where the heck? What a dolt. God, I guess if I was that ugly, I'd take a cheap job, too. Anyway, um, the image that you're alluding to, Suits, uh, Craig Peterson made that. I got a serious compliment from him today. You know what it was? And I'm being humble, and he was being humble. He sent me an email, which I have, obviously. I didn't talk to him on the phone. And about two hours before I was done with that radio show ad, Craig, who is not prone to giving compliments to anybody, he said, uh, I think your radio show ad today is the best ever. And that was about 20 images before I got done. Over to you, David. Okay, so um, let's roll the clock back to 1989. So Hillary Clinton, at the invitation of the French American Foundation, goes on a nine-day trip to Paris. And she comes back with the idea that it takes a village to raise a child. Any idea what the, what village she, she's talking about, Field, over to you? Maybe uh, SOS Children's Villages, because it doesn't take a village to raise a child. It takes one male and one female heterosexual female parents, uh, the state and people that are proponents of state control, like Hillary and the other losers. Uh, when they say it takes uh, a village to raise a child, I would reach out to those in the United States and the rest of the world and say it takes a village idiot to believe Hillary Clinton. How do you respond to that, Your Honor? I think you're absolutely right. And I think what Hillary was talking about in 1989 was a program developed by the founders of the French American Foundation uh, called SOS Children's Villages. The idea being that if you could recruit a childhood seeing his or her parents fed through a chipper and told that the chipper was supplied by the United States of America, whether it's true or not, that child is an extremely powerful ally in a subsequent attempt to kill Americans around the world. So how many children do we suppose have gone through the grooming by mothers and aunties in SOS Children's Villages since its foundation, I believe, in 1947 or 48, a couple of years after the Second World War, and the transfer of the center of SOS Children's Villages to Canada and New York under the United Nations. Because effectively, that scam of raising children in villages by role models who are almost exclusively women or aunties or lesbians. I haven't yet found any convincing story of an SOS children's villages being run by a role model. Some of the people that you kind of talk about, Phil. So um, can you imagine men, reputable men, running an SOS children's villages for orphans and what might be the product, and you compare that with some of these women who are recruited from, let's say, poor villages in the aftermath of a civil war, and are very willing, I imagine, if they paid a little bit of money, to tell the children in their care anything they want. I mean, that's a run-on run -on question. I don't know. Have you got any comments to make on that? Sure. Dilated anus. Well, that sounds, well that's probably what would take the circumflex. Yes, well, that's exactly what would happen because these people like Ed Heath, David Cameron, Jimmy Savile, a bunch of the popes and priests, uh, what they like to do is they like to, they like to engage young men from behind. Uh, you didn't have a chance to to look at many photos. I got a wonderful picture of a pope French kissing a schoolboy of about seven years old. Uh, these guys are offensive. Uh, not only did they offend me. But they offend uh, the person that is being alluded to in Psalm 118.8.
Would a woman in Florida or a woman in Texas please put up Psalm 118.8? I'd do it myself, but I'm exhausted after putting seven hours into that radio show ad. Uh, couldn't come at a better time because this morning, David, this is a yes or no question. Do you know the name Tim White? Yes. He was on the phone with 32, or excuse me, he was on the phone for 32 minutes having a very productive conversation with one of the managing partners of one of the most powerful law firms in the country whose specialty is aviation incidences. But what gives them a leg up, I say again, a leg up, Ginger, um, is they're all aviation professionals before they became attorneys. Uh, so the issue that they started to lick their chops over was the fact that this helicopter crash, which has been in the last couple radio show ads, would some guy that's, let me see if Jake's here. Ugh. Jake, are you here? Uh, do, do, do. I'm, I'm not stalling for time, David. I want to, Jake is not here. Okay, somebody else will have to put up the picture if they can. In today's radio show ad or Friday's, there were pictures of the inferno that resulted when a horrendously unsafe helicopter made by Airbus, and they've been made for the last 35 years. They've got a, a known, they've got multiple known defects, but uh, the one I consider most significant is the fact that if you fall from as little as 100 feet, uh, which should not cause anyone to be grievously injured, well, except for one thing, you're going to be fried because they got a thin, um, thin walled plastic fuel cell directly below the transmission. Uh, and when that thing hits, when the helicopter hits the ground, the fuel cell breaks loose from its mount and fuel is spewed over hot engine parts. And so this man that somebody might want to Google this man's name, I'll do it slowly. Swamp Rat says, uh, Psalm 118.8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Yeah, and I think that's why I have the nerve, if you will, notice I didn't say balls, to put Bush's head on a plate and publish it and send it right to the government. Screw these piss ants. Uh, we have to take a break, David, because our sponsors, Cavendish and Henry, excuse me, I always goof that up. Cavendish and Harvey, they want to remind everybody that Operation Hot Kitchen's back on the front burner because Operation Rose Petal uh, got delayed because the movie maker who did the wonderful movie on Commander Harold Goulding, who has a status in the real world higher than James Bond, who is fiction, um, Harold Goulding's movie maker and granddaughter uh, have, uh, you know, it's pretty hard for them to come up to speed with what we do and how we do it. So. They think it might be better if I don't show up in my regalia um, and Haleen Island on the 21st of August. Uh, so, David, over to you. Oh, and uh, Swamp Rat, thanks for that image. That image right there killed a guy named Patrick uh, Mahaney, M-A-H-A-N-Y. And when he was eulogized, uh, apparently I was not there. I was busy crossing the Texas-Oklahoma border. Uh, but he was eulogized, eulogized extremely favorably by many, many people. He saved many, many lives. In his last act of heroism, and I don't use that term often, um, he, with the little control he had of that helicopter, he ensured that when it crashed, it didn't crash onto vehicles with people in them. Otherwise, they would have been fried too. David, over to you. Yeah, unlike the uh, helicopter crash on the, is it the Clusa pub? In Glasgow. In Scotland? Yes. That was a fade out kit. That's right. And you mentioned, just repeat what that technology was, the plastic uh, doodad uh, in the crash. You mean the lethal part that caused the fire? Yeah. Airbus is now a, uh, they've taken over control and therefore fiduciary responsibility for what was previously Eurocopter. And this Eurocopter model A350, maybe AS350, has had a, uh, it has had multiple known defects going back to 1977, I think. Somebody can find out. In fact, I can find out later. If anybody wants to know, I can put you in touch with Tim White. Uh, anyway, 
uh, the the most grievous uh, shortcoming of that. Hey, my phone's ringing, David. I don't have any idea who it is. Hang on, I want to find out. Maybe bear with me. Oh, I guess that party just wanted to hear my ringtone, which is okay. I know who it was. This Astar A350 Airbus uh, helicopter. Airbus didn't build it. They inherited this piece of shit. You heard me correctly from uh, Eurocopter. And since it was first uh, come, since it was first deployed, there's been a whole lot of these things crashing. And one of the scariest uh, malfunctions is that when it hits the ground. By the way, for those of you who don't know, when a helicopter loses power, in other words, the engine isn't working, it doesn't have to crash. What it does is it's going to be descending because of gravity. I think we all understand gravity. Um, I think most of us do. Some of us who weigh more understand more about gravity than we do. Uh, when the thing starts going down, the downward velocity of the helicopter causes more air and more air and more air to go through the rotors, which drives the rotors faster and faster in terms of their rotational energy. And then right before you're going to hit the ground, the pilot pulls up on the uh, collective or cyclic. I have to think about that. Um, I think it would be, I think it would be the cyclic, not the collective. I'm not a helicopter pilot. I miss doing that by that much. But anyway, uh, fortunately, uh, because if I'd been a helicopter pilot, I wouldn't be in the position I'm in today where people in Malaysia and Germany and now Colorado and Texas are interested. Griffin, thank you for putting up that Scottish helicopter that was taken out by a dual Theta yet. Maybe it was a single Theta yet. But uh, David, the fuel tank is suspended uh, underneath the transmission of the A-Star. I think maybe a better name for that instead of a star, maybe a hole, uh, because you, they put your remains in a hole after you crash one of those things. But the fuel tank is very thin gauge plastic, and even though it's probably mounted securely enough with metal mounts, when there's enough vertical velocity in a crash to cause the plastic to fail because of the weight of all the fuel that's in the tank, and keep in mind when this Pat Mahaney's Chop look at it, it lost its tail rotor. That's what caused the crash. You can't control a helicopter's flight trajectory if the tail rotor fails, which is what happened. So working with very little, and I'm gonna hark back to a day in September of 91 when I should have died in an F-16 crash and there was only one guy in the airplane and that was me, and I didn't save the airplane. And if anybody wants to see who saved the airplane, go back to Swamp and uh, Psalm 118.8. Hope I got that right. Uh, but anyway, the plastic fails, the fuel burst, and everything's hot because you just took off. And that's, that's when you're generating the most power is when you're lifting off in a helicopter or when you're accelerating down the runway at takeoff power in a convention. And you get sprayed and vapor from fuel, uh, suddenly you have the equivalent of toasted marshmallows and s'mores, uh, but instead of being food products, it's actually human beings who have souls. And um, one of those souls was Pat Mahaney. Uh, the guy had a history of flying helicopters going back to the Vietnam War. He was extremely well known and well respected in the rotary wing community. And uh, not only Tim White, his cousin, but somebody that used to write fiction uh, in a character as able, uh, excuse me, Agent Chips. There's a couple of people who've been communicating uh, over the weekend with this powerful aviation law office. And yes, they're going to get a lot of money if this goes to trial, but that's not their motivation. These guys are aviation professionals who are a little bit PO'd uh, that. I probably should not say PO, I should probably say it out, but I'll just, everybody knows what I meant. Um, they're probably going to vent a lot of that anger at David Tochin of the NTSB and Michael Huerta. I'm not even going to mispronounce your name, you piece of excrement. Michael Huerta knows about the Baker's Dozen, he knows about the BUAP, he knows about the ATI, and I don't know if he speaks uh, 
uh, Spanish, but if he does, besa tu kula, goodbye. Besa tu kula, adios. I wonder if uh, Alicia is here. She speaks Spanish. But anyway, anybody know what I just said in Spanish to Michael? Guerta! David, over to you. Yeah, no, I don't know what that said. What you said in Spanish, uh, but I am very interested that uh, the idea that if you had, I think we called them in a book so far back, I can't remember what it was called, tallywhackers. But if you had uh, an ignition system that could be remotely uh, triggered, then to the casual observer, I guess you would infer the time of death of the people on that helicopter. And there's only one company in the world that can trigger end times for a high or a low value target, that is circuit, because to trigger the end time of death for an assassination betting pool, you need a super, a super accurate clock to timestamp the image where the average Joe or Jill would infer that the individual was killed. Otherwise, you're going to get a bunch of dispute. Particularly if you're doing, you know, dealing not just in a few hundreds of thousands of dollars, but maybe a billion dollars in the betting pool associated with the death of, let's say, Princess Di. So first paragraph, today's post. One, Hillary Clinton allegedly repurposed the French-American Foundation to sponsor cyber assassination betting out of Les Grands Chênes d'Hôtel. That's the grand chains of hotels or the big hotel chains such as Sheraton and Hilton and Langham etc etc Les Grandes Chains d'Hôtel and the, the O of hotel has a second flex because historically there's a letter a consonant that has disappeared because back way back when it would have been called a hostel Gradually over the time, the S disappeared, and to indicate the disappearance of the S and change pronunciation slightly, way above my head, they stick this little circumflex. And where online guests bet on a predicted time of death and remote winners closest to the proven time scoop the pot. Now, when she came back, that's Hillary Clinton, from that trip to France, now, I don't know whether she's fluent in French, but she's been associated as a young leader with the French Amer American Foundation for a great deal of time. What would be interesting is in 1989, she'd come back presumably to her job of first lady of Arkansas. Now, can you tell me, Phil, maybe some of the chat room can, was she still practicing as the first female patent lawyer at Rose Law while she was first lady of uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Do you happen to know that? No, it would actually be she was the first lady of Arkansas, the state, not the city. Yes. Uh, okay. I don't know, but somebody could find out. Swamp could probably find out, but I think she needs a break. Uh, I could find out too, but I don't, I'm not going to use bandwidth. But it doesn't really matter. She's not qualified to be an attorney. She's not qualified to be anything. Um, she's not qualified to be the person that loses to a conservative Republican in the next election. Uh, I think she is qualified to uh, maybe be a, a model for people that, um, well, never mind, that's a little too much. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to censor myself. I, suffice it to say, I think she's one of the most worthless, hostile, evil people in America. And if there's anybody that's more evil and more hostile than Hillary Clinton, it is my sister, Christine Marcy. And if you Google Hillary Clinton plus Christine, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, Marcy, M-A-R-C-Y, which is short for Marciano, maybe, maybe not. Do you feel lucky? Um, Hillary Clinton, Christine Marcy, and Georgetown. David, do you remember at one point uh, about a year ago I was talking about a three-ring service circus? Yes. Well, guess what I'm wearing today for the first time in the last 11 months? Uh, your ring? Three rings. And you know why I put them on today? I don't like jewelry. I never wear it. Most of you have never seen me with these things on. 
Uh, two of them have red seals. The third one has a red stone. Huh, isn't that odd? This red seal and the seal, the two red seals are from when I sealed my letter to the IRS that I sent on the 22nd of May and the sniveling spineless cowards who were turned on to me by the weaponized IRS uh, chief slinger of crap, Barack H. Obama. Uh, I sealed the letter and said, and I said, no dice. I'm not playing your games. Don't talk to me anymore. You got 30 days to respond. Well, here we are on July 13th, and they haven't responded. Uh, so they now are officially uh, DO. Or, wait a minute, that was going to—that's yours, DOA. Do you know what DIW stands for, David? I'll give you the first word: dead. Dead. No. Dead in the water. Should actually have four no. letters, but in uh, DIW, dead in the water. And see, the IRS is dead in the water with me. That doesn't mean they might not try to come back and hurt me somehow. Uh, the reason why my sister and Obama need to hurt me is I'm sort of like, uh, I don't think it would be inaccurate to say the man who knows too much. Uh, unfortunately for them, they can't touch me. David, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, you know enough, actually, to be the greatest threat to this matrix, which the RCMP called the virtual floating matrix um, that they've ever encountered in their existence. How long is their existence? Well, if we come back to the idea of uh, online or cyber assassination betting, if you change the technology out from online and the internet back to the telegraph, it's just as feasible to engage in telegraph assassination betting in the 19th century as it is in internet assassination betting in the 21st century. The technique is the same, the technology has perhaps adjusted a little bit. But if we go back to, you know, the Whitechapel murders, after Jane Addams had gone back to Chicago, Jane Addams in 1888 in Chicago would have been able to telegraph her instructions or bets, if you will. Remember, she was always looking for money to run this orphanage where vulnerable children were in the custody of a couple of lesbians. Not just uh, ordinary lesbians, nothing wrong with that. You know, it depends on your point of view, but I got no problems with that. But these are what in, front, in French would be called les lesbiennes radicales. Ellen Starr and Jane Addams in August of 1888 were either visiting or staying at Toynbee Hall right at the heart of the canonical murders attributed to Jack the Ripper. Did I teach you what canonical meant, Phil? Yes, we did that on the 8th of August of 2007 while we were talking about leverage, arbitrage, British invisibles at Boston Investments, uh, Mitt Romney's mantle pants, and uh, Hillary's foul taint. And taint, of course, is technical analysis involving naval treason. And I think somebody just put up something. Let's see. Swap, you are, if that's what I think it is, I, David, uh, I just asked two frames ago, I said, could somebody please get the letter I sent to the IRS? It is at YouTube and probably would come up with uh, the search terms. Oh, Doug McNichol in England, thank you very much. Ginger Cookie apparently found it. Yeah, I guess it's not too hard to find. Yeah, well, the, anyway, um, I'm, I'm impressed by our chat room, Dave, but I'm also impressed by our dogged determination, not me and you alone, me and you and the cat. Me and you and a dog named Boo, living and a living, loving and a living off the land. Me and you and a dog named Boo, how I love being a free man. Anybody remember that song? And I have to tell you that if you think the guy's name was Lobo, you're close. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Well, I think canonical in that context, and I hadn't heard of it in that context, as described to the Jack the Ripper murders, was that the five women um, were disemboweled or abused or um, 
their bodies were disrespected in a way that was similar enough to assume that it was the same party or similar parties doing the disrespecting. And uh, I think what we're finding now with this cyber assassination betting that I think was pioneered by Hillary Clinton and the French American Foundation after she came back from France in 1989 is that we see the MO, modus operandi, of the killings as canonical. That is to say, there's something, some meta system, we can call it a cyber system, that is able to deliver the end time for a target with great precision. Not just within a minute, but within a second, quite possibly within a millisecond. So if we take that aircraft that went into the French Alps, and I believe 430 miles an hour, allegedly piloted by Andreas Lubitz, while the pilot was locked outside the cabin. Assuming there was a camera inside the cockpit, and, and why wouldn't there be, in spite of the protestations of Michael? Where the? Why That's very good. I didn't know your Spanish. I didn't know your Spanish was as good as your French. Could you repeat, Michael? Where Name again? Michael Yeah, well, let's all, you know what we all should do? I mean, some people are timid to do this. We should all, as many people as have the nerve, and it doesn't take any nerve. I mean, here I sit. Uh, what did I drive today? Oh, yeah, the 96 speed limo. Because I got the purple limo uh, over at the shop because the guy that owns the shop has to bury two relatives Friday or Saturday. And he asked me if, if he'd mind if I, uh, like, no, if, if I'd mind if he used one of my limos. I said, anything I have is yours anytime you want it. So um, I got two of the cars getting their air conditioners tuned up so that if the purple one develops a maintenance problem at the last moment, which it shouldn't because he's a mechanic and he, re he takes care of the vehicles, I'm going to have two limos down there because guess where I'm going to be this weekend, David? Uh, no. I'm going to be at my daughter's wedding. And so if you want to have a Friday show, you either need to get Craig to do it or you and I need to do it Thursday. Okay, I'm open to any suggestions. Okay, I think it'll be Thursday because I anticipate that Craig won't have time. Uh, he has willingness. He's, he's not, uh, he's the opposite of egotistical. Um, I guess that would be humble. Uh, but he doesn't seek attention. And for that matter, neither do I. I don't, I'm not in this position because I want to be here. Uh, Swamp Rat knows how come I'm in this position, but there's no human alive that would want my position. But as long as I'm in this position, I know how to play the cards. And that is by making sure I deal off the bottom of the deck and I keep a couple of jokers in my pocket. Uh, let's see, what is that song I'm thinking of, David? It's the old... Don't count your money while you're sitting at the table. There'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. You know, this dealing's going to be done one way or the other because there's a prestigious law firm that's about ready to open up a wrongful death uh, for Patrick Mahaney, M-A-H-A-N-Y. And if that law firm, and notice I'm not saying because I don't want, you know, I don't want to get anybody in trouble other than the perverts like my sister, Hillary, uh, John McCain, Lindsey Graham, Giuliani, Jamie Gorelick, Janet Reno, who drools. Um, let's see, um, uh, Pat Schrader. Uh, there's so many of pe these people that are sold their soul to Satan, uh, and you can't buy it back. You know, uh, once you're done, uh, once you leave the, our team, uh, then tick tock, the game's locked. Uh, can you be forgiven? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, but I don't think Satan will let him come back. Uh, there's a great song by, what's his name, Todd Rundgren. If there's a shortcut, I'd have found it, but there is no other way around it. Light of the world, shine on me, love is the answer. Shine on us all, set us free, love is the answer. Well, anyway, as much as I'd like to be loving uh, you, who are you? You know who you are. 
but I'd love to be loving. However, right now I'm busy putting a couple heads on a plate. David, how do you like that little play on words where I've got uh, James Sabo's autopsy and uh, I mentioned bushes, plural, head on plate. Uh, there's a lot of bushes. Reggie Bush is a running back for 16 or 17 different NFL teams. And then Laura Bush was supposed to be killed on 9-11. She was in the Capitol. But she dodged a bullet because some powerful entity imputed a 41-minute delay in the departure of Captain Jason Dahl's United 93 from Liberty's, what is that? No, it's Newark's Liberty International Airport, which has parallel runways 2, 3, and of course, 0, 5. And when you're either taking off or landing on 2, 3 left, you better hope you don't have any loose teeth because they're right there at sea level and that runway is soft and uneven. David, over to you. Yeah, that's interesting, Phil, about that imputed delay because that uh, disrupted the cyber assassination betting pools in the nearby Clinton hotels, or Hotel Clintons, because the idea was by the conspirators that they would identify a plane that had taken off within a 60 minute flight time where they could impute an ad hoc waypoint so that one plane would drive into the first floor window of the Pentagon's US Navy Command Center and the other would hit the Capitol building and decapitate the lawmaking body of the United States, the legislative body, killing, I would guess, their objective was about 500 congressmen and senators, which would have decapitated America. But they couldn't find a plane. And you know what, Phil? I don't believe any of the alleged hijackers were on any of those planes. Those planes had been modified with what I think historically we called Talawacker devices, but what Hillary Clinton would probably call um, uh, the Jarocha devices, where she, when she was the patent lawyer at Rose Law, mm -hmm. had brokered the development of the triaxial gyroscope embedded with these gyro chips produced or invented by uh, BEI Industries at Little Rock so that a plane could go through a waypoint and then be programmed with an imputed waypoint to fly directly into that target. And the, from the point of view of the online betters or the cyber assassination betters, they, were, they would have wanted proof with a time-stamped money shot that the winner of the pot had legitimately predicted the time of death of the people on board more accurately than any else, anyone else. Second paragraph today, former Marine General James Jones Jr. has allegedly equipped Francophone mentored 8A companies. Francophone is a French speaking agent and he may or she may speak multiple languages, but my understanding is your sister speaks French, although she hides it under her bush. I'm sorry, hides it under her bushel. Is that a correct description? Bushel basket. Now don't hide it under your... No, hang on a minute, I gotta sing this, and I wish somebody would give me the lyrics because I don't know them. In fact, I, I don't have a bushel, but I have a cup. Let me end it. Empty it. It's talking about your light. Light of the world. Anyway, if you had a candle that was lit, the admonition in the children's song is, don't hide it under your bushel, no. Anyway, and then you take your bushel off the light, and the world seeds the light. And the United States of America was once and could be again a light of the world. Shine on me, love is the answer. Shine on us all. Set us free, love is the answer. Uh, Free A put up a comment about EWR, and if he answers me, I'll answer him. But David, uh, yeah, as far as my sister and Bush, uh, meaning Jeb Bush, uh, I would rather not hear either Hillary or my sister's name uh, in the same 12-volume 12 12 
set of 500 page novels, if there's anywhere in there where Hillary or Christine Marcy and Bush, uh, I think the entire set of books should be burned because uh, that's just a disconnect. So anyway, over to you, David. Okay, so former Marine General James Jones Jr. has allegedly equipped Francophone mentored HA companies with the Navy Onion Router, Tor, to track targets through Hotel Clinton cyber systems and camouflage what are in reality GPS spot fixed contract hits, GPS meaning global positioning systems. So going to Andreas Lubitz, there would have been a camera inside the cockpit of that aircraft that was pointed at Mr. Lubitz that would have shown him being tranquilized before the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot was hijacked remotely after passing a waypoint on the southern coast of France in the Mediterranean. That aircraft would have been flying with passengers and possibly crew who had stayed at the Sheraton Hotel in Barcelona or one of the other members of the Hotel Clinton chain of hotels and would have been staying at the Dusseldorf Hotel Clinton. So the staff of those hotels would have known exactly when either a high value target such as Yvonne Selleck or a lower value target, although in the great scheme of things, all of these people who die in wrongful deaths are of equal value in a court of law. So I think that's rather intriguing. A lower value target such as Andreas Lubitz. They would have known to the second when the till or whatever it is in the hotel checked out the guest. And that, I believe, field is when the spread betting starts in cyberspace. That is, people either in that hotel or some hotel to which is connected through the virtual floating matrix built by Circa can start betting on whether the individual is going to die before the beginning of the spread or after the closing of the spread, which might be a minute or uh, five minutes or whatever. That's up to the bookmaker. The bookmaker's job, basically the bookmaker to White's Club in the London, is to open, I think, what is called the playbook that starts when the high-value target checks out of a hotel in the virtual floating matrix developed by Clinton. And before they check into a hotel in Dusseldorf. And so the big institutions, whether they are witting or unwitting, willing or unwilling, are forced to put up their uh, clients' money on either side of the spread. Now, within the spread, which might be eight minutes, as I say, a very interesting example of a carefully timed spread can be heard by listening to the voice cockpit recorder. Cockpit voice recorder. All right, the cockpit voice recorder. Because it's very obvious. The Mayday call having been deleted from what the public is told, and apparently they issued a Mayday call just after crossing that waypoint. Where is that Mayday call? It should be on the voice, the cockpit voice recorder. But the cockpit voice recorder that I've heard doesn't have the Mayday call. What it does have, Phil, is the steady breathing of the young man who's about to die, indicating that there has been an injection of tranquilizer gas into the cockpit. There is no noise from the passenger cabin, which indicates the passengers have been tranquilized. Then there is a sort of knocking or scraping sound 
on the cockpit door, which if I understand you correctly feel, could indicate that the pilot who's been locked out is using a portable oxygen unit. Is such a thing inside the cockpit, the passenger cabin? Over to you. Yeah, that's called a walk-around bottle. Watch how quickly somebody Googles walk-around, W-A-L-K-A-R-O-U-N-D, walk-around oxygen bottle. I'm not sure there's anything out there, but that's what we all called it. Oh, and we got time for one more sponsor. And this time the sponsor is not Cavendish and Harvey. And by the way, I'm down to my last two fruit drops. Uh, but this is show our international uh, appeal that candy comes from England. It's sort of the candy asses for that. I'm talking about the ones in our government. The ones in our government are a bunch of candy asses who ought to go back to England like peers and Anderson Cooper and a bunch of other preverts. When I say preverts, I don't mean homo phobes or homo, whatever you call them. Uh, this is our Canadian sponsor, Edmonton Shoe Repair. Um, it's, uh, if anybody wants their postal code, it's T Tango 5 Echo 5 Romeo 8. And uh, it works. Okay, David, over to you. It's walk around bottle. Let's see if anybody put it up. Okay, so the assumption would be that the experienced pilot who allegedly went to the washroom came back and saw that the passengers had been tranquilized, assumed or inferred that the co-pilot, Andreas Lubitz, inside the cockpit had been tranquilized and desperately grabbed one of those transport, transportable oxygen bottles that you talked about and began to think about how he might get into the cockpit. However, I'm less interested in what's going on inside the cockpit and much more interested in what's going on at the Hotel Clinton cyber assassination betting pool. Where is that betting pool? Well, it's everywhere. Anywhere there is a hotel that has been or whose communication systems have been integrated by Circa to every other hotel is part of the Hotel Clinton cyber assassination betting network. <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether it's a Hilton. It doesn't matter whether it's a Sheraton. It doesn't matter whether it's the Marriott Hotel in New York, which is described as Hotel 911. And my weakness in my forensic analysis was to realize that in the title of that, I think, BBC feed, BBC4 documentary, where it reads Hotel 911, it should be Hotel 911 because this is a francophone conspiracy field, a conspiracy of French-speaking people. And if you look at the 8A companies that were controlled by your sister from 1998 through to 2001 attack, you'll see there are a number of 8A companies that ought to make Americans very suspicious. And these are companies owned by people who belong to what the community organizers choose to call disadvantaged groups, women, black, or people from countries such as Vietnam. Now, General Jones is a Vietnam vet apparently decorated. He was raised in Paris for whatever reason, and he went to the American school in Paris. Presumption is he speaks, speaks fluent French, so he knows what he can do with the circumflex after we have shoved it up is, you know, where the sun doesn't shine. You mean near his anus and rectum? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, General Jones, uh, his daughter, no, excuse me, his niece was sitting next to me I was in 1A, she was in 1B. We were en route from Minneapolis to Dallas on an Airbus, and she came up from behind, and I said, I've been around the airlines 40 years, how'd you do that? She said, oh, some guy wanted to sit with his wife, he gave me his first class seat. I'll speed this up, because I mentioned it last week. Uh, she said something about, I, I said, I investigate people that are uh, egotistical, elitist, and uh, aren't capable of doing anything without support. She said, oh, do you ever look at military people? I said, yeah, sure I do. She said, would you like to know the name of a, a U.S. Marine general who's a complete 
doofus? And I said, well, I don't know. Is his name's James Jones? And she's her teeth just about fell out because that's her, that's her uncle. And uh, he's such a pompous ass that when one of his daughters or nieces was getting married, he arrived at the reception in a, in a Marine Corps helicopter in his dress whites. That's a formal uniform, David O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks. And I just stuck up in the chat room um, uh, image of a statue in the grounds of the Grand Hotel, which is part of the Hotel Clinton Cyber Matrix for the Bilderberg 2013. So I've come to the conclusion, field that whilst we are being decoyed into thinking that the folks who show up at the Bilderberg hotels are powerful, I don't think they're powerful at all. I think the staff of the Bilderberg Hotel, which I think goes back to 1954, are engaged in the collection of compromising images and material that allow them to blackmail and extort concessions from the delegates at the Bilderberg Hotel. And that practice started back in 1954 at the first Bilderberg uh, convention or meeting. And apparently the man who had this bright idea of, I don't know, entrapping guests in four-star or five-star hotels with children and then getting the incriminating material collected by the staff was none other than a man by the name of Lord Boothby who worked with the Cray twins to take control of organized crime in London. Hey, David, speaking of lords, yeah. have you ever heard of Lord Porkchester? Yes, I saw that on the show today. Yeah, that's Prince Andrew's daddy. So if the Queen's, if the Queen is Prince Andrew's mommy, uh, did you see my verb regarding Porkchester and what he did with the Queen? No. I'm not going to say it because I'm not that type of a guy, but I had great delight with that series of pictures because no matter where I Google, I find myself, and no matter where I Google evil, I find certain families, and the royals, of course, are right there at the top notch. So Lord Porchester, who was the racehorse advisor to the royals, apparently when uh, Prince Fardingham was on a trip, uh, the porkmeister took over. David, over to you. Yeah, I was just looking at the chat room, so I popped in an image of Tor, the onion router, and some guy with long hair doing whatever you do with the onion router. But the onion router is the basic technology used for what is called online assassination betting. And I choose to use cyber assassination betting because I think it's a more uh, generic, uh, generic term. And the idea of the cyber or onion router is that you can place these bets on the predicted time of death of some target without actually being associated at the first blush with hiring someone to whack him at a particular moment in time. Interesting thing there about that law firm you just mentioned, Field, you mentioned it almost in the same breath as the idea of wrongful death, which is the remedy I've always been I've always believed is the most powerful remedy because uh, proof of wrongful death, well, there's a lower burden of proof for wrongful death, and it can be related to negligence, reckful, recklessness, willfulness, or fraud. Couldn't we have a, wouldn't we have an aggressive inference of guilt in our favor? Totally. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that we are up to speed on legal matters. Yeah, so if there is any evidence that the cyber systems of the Hotel Clinton chain of hotels around the world has been tampered with, or any evidence that the imputation of ad hoc wave points from someone in the hotel in the vicinity of an attack or a crime scene, such as the Pentagon City Hotel uh, guests or staff, who may or may not have imputed ad hoc waypoints into the weapons platform that took out the Pentagon's U.S. Navy Command Center on September the 12th, 2001 at 19, 17, 37, 19. And where do I get that from? Well, there's a photograph or an image. You know what, Phil? That's the money shot. That's the money shot that is trying to tell the members of the cyber assassination betting pool 
by inference, remember we're entitled to the aggressive inference of guilt, that the time at which your US Naval Academy classmate, Captain Chick Birmingham, and I don't think he was in the same class because he's younger than you, but the uh, Captain Gerald de Conto, the duty officer of the US Navy Command Center, they are trying to tell us by inference that those people died on September the 12th, 2001, at 1737-19. And the problem for them, the conspirators, is that gives us the right to an aggressive inference of guilt because the date and the time stamp are wrong, at least as it applies to sitting in the National Command Center or the hotel. Because in that little piece of real estate, the date was September the 11th, 2001. And the time was 9.37.19. Which means the conspirators in the cyber assassination betting pool are somewhere else, remote from the crime scene. And that inevitably leads us to Bill Clinton, who was staying at the Port Douglas Sheraton Hotel in Australia on the morning of September the 12th in Australia, presumably watching in real time as the date stamp and the time stamp on his systems were ticking to see if he was going to scoop the pot. Now, he may or may not have been told at exactly what second that Captain Gerald de Conto and Captain Chick Burlingham um, we're going to die, but he probably did have skin in the game. I think that's the phrase for you've got your money on the table if you're playing poker or whatever. Now, where would this useless grifter get some skin to put in the game? Well, how about the Clinton Foundation, where some of the biggest donors are the Qatar government and the United Arab Emirates government? who did have skin in the game on 911. So where in the world is 1737-19? Well, that would be with the guest or guests in the Dubai Creek Hotel where I stayed before I found accommodation to rent while I served three years in the United Arab Emirates as a troubleshooter. Or incident, it just reminds me, Phil, when you were talking about helicopter rotors coming off, I was um, at various times employed in helping to firefight explosions on offshore rigs. And a rig I'd just visited, an offshore rig off Dubai, and I came back into town, um, a helicopter landed, and for some obscure reason, there were people greeting this helicopter up on the heli deck and the rotor fell off and about three people got decapitated. That's the sad story, but that's what happens with recklessness, willfulness, fraudulent or negligence. And see, those people, my guess is, they died a wrongful death. And someone should have gone after the rig, management, whatever, and sued for damages and compensated the families of the people killed, whether they did or, you know, I moved on. But that's a very, very powerful remedy because to prove you were not negligent, like all these things, it's very difficult to prove a negative. And you can't push a rope. Exactly. Now, is that, is that one of the Clinton bushel that I see? Uh, yeah, it's an, this is actually Sasquatch's Merkin. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Sobering, eh? Well, it's uh, it's one way that she she or it prevents anyone trying to come within 200 yards of her. I understand that when she was a young boy in Chicago that she was so ugly that her dad had to tie a pork chop around his neck. Uh, then she thought the ugliness was because she was a male, and so apparently she went over to Sweden and became a female, or maybe a hybrid, which means 
the high parts sort of flat and the low parts still original equipment. David, over to you. Yeah, now, just to keep us on the ground with General Jones, um, since 1996, in the United States, in Virginia, it looks like directly or indirectly, Serco has been hosting what is known as the French American Defense Symposium, where generals and military personnel from France, presumably Francophones, show up in offices of law firms where folks like General Jones show up and they share techniques for defending the United States of America against cyber attacks, starting in 1996. My question to you as an American, well, I'm a Brit or Canadian, whatever it is, what the hell is America's leading military personnel sitting down in a covert meeting at a lawyer's office with senior people from the French military establishment discussing security of the United States. And I guess my question to you is, Field, how successful do you think these folks were? Well, they're, they're not trying to protect the military structure of the United States from a hack. They're trying to make sure that it's their team that hacks it. Um, I put a, some, but maybe somebody can listen to my ramblings and find the image, but I put an image in today's radio show ad uh, that involved a statement that uh, when they escalated the war in Vietnam and it was on a fall morning in 1965, the five people on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which involved, there was uh, two Army guys, one was the Chief of Staff, one was the Army Chief, then there was a Marine chief who was a short guy named Green. Then there was an Air Force chief whose name was McConnell. Then there was a Navy guy from Georgia whose father was a minister, so we can probably assume Baptist. Uh, his name was McDonald, and he was a pilot, and I believe Green was a pilot. The, the Marine and the Navy guy were both pilots, if I'm not mistaken, and one of you know me to be mistaken. Uh, one of those five was a known shill, uh, a, a traitor, a cheater, and I put out the question in the picture. I said, does anybody know which guy in this group of five flag officers was the sellout and was telling uh, the, the audience was between LBJ and the five military leaders who were all telling LBJ, don't escalate Vietnam, bad, bad choice. Uh, LBJ, who was not only cantankerous, bullheaded, stubborn, uh, bullying, but also produced a lot of methane in elevators, much to the chagrin of the Secret Service agents that had to ride with him. And the reason I know that is there's a federal narc who served in the uh, DEA from 68 until 93 who told me that. Uh, now, how, how did he know? Uh, I presume an elevator ride. But LBJ was not a very nice person. Uh, he was more than happy to bump off his boss, JFK, with the help of the Hunts. Um, what's that guy's name? Uh, Murchison. Um, George H.W. Bush, who was a CIA agent. Uh, and I bet nobody out there, I'm going to give it over to you, David, but I bet nobody can tell me, uh, and I hope I'm wrong because I've said it before, and if people are listening, they'll remember. Anybody know the name of the pilot that took the shooters out of Dallas Love Field and flew him back to New Orleans on the 22nd of November of 1963. Over to you, David. Not Ferrier? Yeah, that's very close. Who did you say? Ferrier. Yeah, F-E-R-R-I-E. -R -R -E. David Ferry, I think is his name. I'll put that out to the chat room. The pilots would have been uh, David Ferry, and one of his understudies was Barry, and excuse me, Adler, Behrman Adler Seal, known as Barry Seal, uh, who was double-crossed by the Bush family, uh, meaning Jeb Bush and G.H.W. Bush. And you know what? You can kill Barry Seal. You can kill Colonel James Sable. 
but you can't kill me. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. David, over to you. Yeah, I bet you Ferry is connected with the Francophones in the 8A companies that would eventually one day be reformed by your sister starting in 1998 to provide the cyber assassination times or end times necessary for the 911 attack. But anyway, on to, on to paragraph three, today's post. Serco's 8A protégés allegedly used Hotel Clinton cyber system devices installed on Princess Diana's Mercedes while it was in the custody of Ritz Paris staff to stamp an end time on the money shot images of her perceived death when her car was steered into the 13th column of the Pont d'Alma tunnel in Paris at 12.23 a.m. on Sunday, August 31st, 1997. Funny how, you know, serendipity works. Um, I used to drive along that uh, road tunnel between Paris, where I lived, and the research centre of Chambre out at Clamart. And some years before, I think that would have been, ooh, what, 1960 or 61 or something like that. I was hitchhiking around Europe near Petit Clamart. I was wearing a camo jacket, which I got from the Army and Navy store, and a baker's van stopped to give me a lift. I got in the back of the van. The van screeched to a halt. The door of the van swung open, and there were armed gendarmerie who pointed their guns at me and said in their best French, well, I don't know if it was particularly good French, a terre or something like that. So I was thrown to the ground face first with these guns in my back. And then the, the baker's van driver who came round and evidently explained in French that I was just uh, some poor French uh, British schoolboy or something that hitchhiking around Europe. They let me go, but someone had just taken a pop shot at De Gaulle. And so there's a great film, The Day of the Jackal, which, like all these things, is a limited hangout. There's a bit of truth in it. I mean, the hitman was a pucker speaking Englishman. Um, and I think we will find there were pucker, that means sort of upmarket aristocratic speaking Englishman behind the assassination of Little Di. Why would they kill her? Who, who threatened her? Kill who? Princess Di. Because she was pregnant with an Arab seed. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that she discovered the pedophile entrapment operations at the Hotel Clinton, quite possibly including the headquarters of the Gestapo in World War II, which was the Paris Ritz, because these guys haven't invented anything. They don't have the brains. What they have found is that if you build a luxury hotel where people feel honored and well served, it attracts a whole bunch of scumbags, including born aristocrats, you know, like the Duke of Windsor, do, do, who became do. The, Duke, the Duke of Windsor after abdicating as King Edward the Seventh or Eighth, and he used to stay at a hotel called the Imperial Hotel in Vienna where Adolf Hitler was a rent boy. A bit like Barry in Chicago. As I understand it, he became a rent boy at the Man's Country Club for rich white homosexuals. And his particular way of giving pleasure, we don't need to go into that. How he developed those techniques probably associated with the time in, when he was seven or eight years old where his mother, Anne Dunham, had him groomed by a cross-dressing male prostitute called Turdy. Am I inventing things? Well, I don't think so. Just Google Turdy or Evie, and you'll get the pictures. Uh, I don't assign any moral responsibility to a seven or eight-year-old in the hands of these scumbags. Uh, however, of course, it's very formative, and maybe that's the basis of what Hillary Clinton means when she says it takes a village to raise a child. Well, if you want to raise a child 
as an expert in pedophile entrapment who can then turn around and kill the victims without remorse, because there are two kinds of victims in that relationship, well, why wouldn't Hillary Clinton have picked that idea up from SOS Children's Villages and the techniques developed by the British before World War II, in the run-up to World War II, all the way back to the Langham Hotel 1865, which was opened by the Prince of Wales, who would go on to become King Edward VII. And from the American Civil War point of view, it behoves the Americans to study the route taken by the Prince of Wales back then, because in 1860 or 1861, he was in Washington meeting President, I think it's Buchanan. And the Prince of Wales at that time was evidently a skilled user of the telegraph and the Playfair cipher. So if you wanted to bet on the time of death, you could declare the time, the name of the target, and the money you were putting into the pot, and have that recorded at the General Post Office in London for, for example, a prostitute. Now, a prostitute, is she in and of herself an important person for these scumbags? No, but what would happen if Toynbee Hall managers had bought said prostitutes' children to be groomed in the art of pedophile entrapment at the upmarket hotels, such as the Langham Hotel. And what would happen if said prostitute wanted to blow the whistle on this? They'd have to kill her. And they'd have to set it up so it didn't look like it was uh, people at Toynbee Hall, the kind of people who entertained Ellen Starr and Jane Adams in 1888 in August probably since they were radical lesbians with little girls staying at Toynbee Hall. So I think it was the first or second murder of the prostitutes where someone wrote a letter in red ink. Oh, yeah, isn't that exciting? And signed it Jack the Ripper. So the media attributed the murders to this fictional character, Jack the Ripper, and well over a hundred years later, it's still a cold case. But the man who was summoned to the crime scene, a man by the name of uh, Frederick Aberdeen, I think I might have got that surname wrong, he was a detective at Scotland Yard, he pops up at these crime scenes and somehow the clues lead nowhere except towards this mythical character who signed himself in red ink on the letter as Jack the Ripper. What happened to Frederick Aberdeen next? He was a clockmaker, incidentally, before he became a cop. He became the manager or director of the European Agency of Pinkerton Group. Where did Pinkerton get its reputation for solving crime and catching criminals? From a Frenchman, a French convict who was in and out of jail, who somehow the frogs uh, took their eye off the ball and made him head of La Cibete Nationale in Paris. And he solved lots of crimes and apparently used these techniques. So my guess is that Monsieur Vidoc in Paris was using exactly the same techniques, except it wouldn't have been cyber assassination betting. It would have been telegraph assassination betting for the rich aristocrats who squatted in the luxury hotels of Paris and London. And that leads us back, folks, to White's Club betting, whose members include Rupert and Nicholas Soames, where Nicholas Soames threatened little die. Accidents will happen. 
Yes, Mr. Soames, and they're going to happen to you. And who else was at White's Club? Well, David Cameron was at White's Club. And David Cameron was at White's Club when he was personal assistant to Norman Lamont, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, an ex Rothschild banker, when the National Physical Laboratory clock used in GPS to predict end times was privatized to circuit, which is now run by Rupert Sands. So all the roads lead back through cyber assassination betting by self-styled aristocrats at White's Club that included, I believe, the Prince of Wales who became King Edward VII and the Prince of Wales who became King Edward VIII and the Prince of Wales who's hanging around waiting to slot into Queen Elizabeth's shoes when she, as my brother says, hops off the perch. So what we're in great danger of doing is you go after the low-hanging fruit like Hillary, but if Hillary went down, we succeeded in exposing her, and the Hotel Clinton cyber assassination network continued to flourish because it's a matrix, a self-healing matrix. It doesn't really matter who they get in as long as they've got, I think they call it the old phrases, the wood over them, and that comes from the gallows, meaning you're hanged from a beam of wood, a piece of rope, and what British intelligence or these people will always say is, do you have the wood over someone such as a candidate for the federal election? And if you don't have the wood over them, they're not going to get into the White House. So the British have the wood over Hillary, they have the wood over Bill, they have the wood over Bambi. And uh, if they step out of line, they're going to get whacked. That's not a threat, it's a promise. Over to you, Phil. I wonder if we get my sister whacked by get putting the idea in Hillary's head that my sister's the one who exposed Hillary's um, oh, lack of accomplishments to me when I downloaded, if that's the proper term, information from a hard drive on the evening of Monday, the 14th of October of 2008. Now, first of all, we have to find out if October 14th was a Monday night. And so would somebody take a look and tell me what day of the week October 14th was? Uh, because if there was a if there was a hard drive downloaded from a laptop at 832 Coachway, uh, Annapolis, Maryland 21401, it would have occurred after 1137 on the evening of the 14th of October. So while we await that, David, uh, do you have anything? Because I think I'm sensing that you want to get going and we're getting close to the bottom of the hour. Uh, but I'll turn it back over to you here as we're waiting to see if uh, this General Dun what's his name, Dunford? Uh, field is standing by to brief General Joseph M. Dunford, USMC Commandant of the Marine Corps, before requesting Congress the authority he needs by way of letters of mark and reprisal to confiscate Serco's cyber assets in the Hotel Clinton assassination pools, as well as the uh, that clock that's uh, not too far from Heathrow, which reminds me, speaking of Heathrow, you know, I, I'm always going over to England on classified missions, uh, and I'm, not, I'm thinking of taking these three items with me next time I go over there. So anybody I might see, uh, so, well, let me think of who I might see if I do go over there. Well, I might see customs, and they'd say, uh, Mr. McConnell, uh, how long will you be in England? And I, I will say, uh, nine nights. And they'll say, Mr. McConnell, do you know we will be staying well in England? I'll say, yes, the Aurora, A-R-O-R-A, -R -R International <laughs> Hotel. And that's in, if anybody wants to look it up, that is in uh, Crawley, C-R-A-W-L-E-Y. And if you want to know if I've ever been there, just see if there's a Morgan's Pub. If there's a Morgan's Pub at the Aurora Hotel in Crawley, it would be a safe bet that I was there on Father's Day of 2010 and I stayed in room 420. 
And some people think I have a good memory. No, I don't. I don't have a good memory at all. Isn't that right, Daryl? Uh, David, here's a boarding pass. Everyone can see the boarding pass, and I'll take it to England when I go on my next trip, if somebody reminds me. I'll just read some of the stuff on this boarding pass. McConnell Field, TSA pre-check, Delta Flight 11, 23 June, Heathrow to Minneapolis, premium seat 6C, docks okay, D-O-C-S, okay. Uh, this, today's radio show, which two people have made favorable comments about, at least the radio show app, uh, this is how I constructed it. Now, if Bye Bye Miss American Pie by Don McLean just brought a million dollar bid, uh, or I guess we could start the bidding at five million dollars for this. Uh, I don't anticipate the bidding will start anytime soon. Uh, but also, it's about the same size as a boarding pass, and that's a bumper sticker, Google Arkansas. And I'm going to rattle off six or seven names of people who may or may not wish to have a Google Arkansas bumper sticker if I go to England again soon. And notice for the record, I didn't say on Delta Flight 11 on the 29th of July of 2015 and to stay there until, well, about 10 days, I guess. But uh, these bumper stickers, these are a collectible item because there was only like 100 of them made back in 2006 or seven, six, 2007. And David, you can't see it, but do you remember the bumper sticker that said, in red, it says Google Ar Arkansas. Then there's a yellow line underneath, and it says www.hawkscafe.com. Those are three items I'll be taking to England when I go next. And also, I've been asked if I'm going to be bringing my... She knows what I'm trying to avoid doing. Uh, Ginger, if you're here, could you tell everybody what I just successfully avoided doing? Uh, so i got a pile of stuff to take to England on my next trip. David, why don't you say something intelligent while we get ready to ask Metzamax for the BRB? Okay, thanks, Phil. So I just, um, the picture I've uh, put in the chat room, this is a view which could be a telephoto lens from the Sheraton Pentagon City Hotel, which shows the removal of evidence from the crime scene which is entirely consistent with the idea that there are people, or there were people in the Sheraton Pentagon City Hotel engaged in Hotel Clinton cyber assassination betting. Because what I believe those people on the Clinton lawn were looking for are the cyber assassination devices, including the onion router and timing systems for the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot, which took the weapons platform into the Pentagon and killed everyone in the Pentagon's US Navy Command Center. So that was a strategic attempt at a coup. It didn't succeed, Phil. So we're on the up and up. And uh, thank heavens that, well, from my point of view, that we met. Over to you. Um, yeah, we did meet. And do you know? Do you remember what day in history we met uh, on the on the telephone? Is that December the sixth, two thousand and six? Yes, that's exactly right. So I guess the medication I suggested is working with you. Uh, George H. S. Field, I bid one tin of Trump and Harry Cans candles. Uh, wait a minute, that's George H. And he's in. I'm going to England. I'm not going to Seattle. The bluest skies I've ever seen are in Seattle. And the, mm, the grass, the greenest green in Seattle. Let's change. Frank Sinatra. There was a girl in Seattle before the blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, our sponsor today has been Cavendish and Harvey Mixed Fruit Drops. They come in this uh, one pound, 79 pence tin of uh, the original with the seal, and these are confectioners for connoisseurs. Uh, I, I may be a connoisseur, but it's not of candy. Uh, which reminds me, David, do you remember a song called Candy Girl? It was on today's radio show, Ed. I think so. I've <clears throat> got to clear my throat. You'll notice the similarities between my voice and um, what's his name? Frankie Valley. I've been a-searching round this big wide world 
And suddenly I found my candy girl. Anyway, uh, that was almost as bad as Michael Huerta. And I see your favorite picture of guys carrying junk from the Pentagon. And so why don't you say something clever, and then I'll ask for the big red button whenever you're done being clever. Uh, yeah, I think I'm exhausted in what remains of my cleverness field, so I'm ready to go. And um, good show. Look forward to the next one. Okay. And in case anybody missed it, I'm going to a wedding on Friday morning, and it's not mine, by the way. Um, and uh, an update. I don't know if Bucky's here. Is Bucky here? Let's find out. Bucky, Bucky, Bucky. Bucky, Bucky, Bucky is here. So Bucky knows this, and he's one of the few people that know it, but we've set up Operation Hearst Extract uh, for not next week. No, yeah, it is next week. Whoa. Bucky, we got to plan fast because uh, we're going to pick the hearse up on Wednesday and drive it from 918 Unabetter, U-N-I-B-E-T-E-R Road in Canton, Georgia, uh, pretty much nonstop, meaning... We'll stop for a beer every 20 miles, but we won't spend a night in a hotel. Um, but I'm going to go get that hearse next week, I think. There's a couple things that it hinges upon. One is, um, uh, let's see, one is getting a seat on the airplane. One is uh, potentially an illness within my family, uh, but it's not me. Uh, I probably should be dead or sick, but I'm neither. Uh, so, David, it sounds like you're done, but you always like to have a no-notice last word. Okay, uh, Phil, I'm, I'm very gratified that you uh, remember what a circumflex is and what you can do with it. It's a sphincter snapper, but uh, it's easier to spell. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't you disconnect yourself, and I'll wait for the big red button, and then I'll disconnect myself. Okay, bye now. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Okay, uh, anybody, including Mensamax, can put up the big red, the big green, or any colored button. Oh, uh, just because I'm urgent to get out of here, I got things to do. No people to see, but things to do. Um, we can, any color button at all, or even a sprinkled donut, an image of a sprinkled donut, anything with that and the three, two, one, uh, push it protocol. I promise. There goes David. Um, a thousand fourteen miles nonstop will likely have some snooze time in the back cabin of the hearse. Yeah, well, that's interesting you should say that because, Bucky, I don't know if you have – there's a big green button. i got to be ready. Bucky, I don't know if you have an air mattress. Uh, top Field top banana. Cheers. Oh, you guys are too nice. Thanks. Um, Bucky, we might want to have a 